Hi, everybody. From Wondery, welcome to another episode of Tides of History. As always, I'm your host, Patrick Wyman. Thanks for joining me. So before we get into today's episode, a chat with history podcaster extraordinaire Mike Duncan, I have a disclaimer. We're going to be talking a lot, maybe even primarily, about present-day politics in broad historical perspective. Specifically, we're going to be talking about how the ongoing crisis caused by the pandemic might affect politics, the economy, and the future contours of our world. It's going to be loose and wide-ranging, and it will prominently feature both his and my personal views. If you do not think that this pandemic is a big deal, if you do not want to hear our personal views, if you don't care about present-day politics, if you think that this will somehow offend you, then by all means, go ahead and turn it off now. There will be plenty of more Tides of History that's more to your liking in other episodes. Be safe and be well. If you do decide to stick around, wonderful. As I mentioned, I'm joined today by the host of the History of Rome and Revolutions podcast. He's also the New York Times bestselling author of The Storm Before the Storm, The Beginning of the End of the Roman Republic, which I highly recommend to you all. He has a new book coming out before too long entitled, Last I Saw, Citizen Lafayette on the Marquis de Lafayette, an absolutely fascinating figure in both French and American history. Mike Duncan, thank you so much for chatting with me today. Uh, thank you for having me, Patrick. So we were kind of talking on Twitter about the pandemic, the way its effects are rippling through our political system, both in the U.S. and worldwide, and I figured we might have a chat about that. Like, basically, this is a crisis. It's a shock, and shocks place stress on existing systems. They expose breaks. They expose points of friction that already exist. They crack them open, and they help to drive change. So from your perspective, sitting in a moment like this right now, how is history a worthwhile tool for helping us understand these things? Well, obviously, history is a useful tool for understanding this because these things have happened before. I mean, you wrote a really nice article about how people don't recognize or realize the change that they themselves are living through because we we often think of uh, great historical climactic moments being like recognizable. Oh, it's the third act of the movie. I know what's coming next. I know that there's going to be a climax and then a denouement and, and everything will work according to some Hollywood script when actually what it is is large scale changes that happen where each day you're still just getting up and going about what appears to be your regular daily routine, but all around you, massive change is unfolding that then when you look back on it, you say, oh my God, that was a major transformative historical moment. And we didn't even necessarily realize we were living through it at the time. But in retrospect, it's obviously happening. And when you work in history, you can have a bit of a sense for how these things do play out. And when they start to happen all around you, as I've been watching them happen all around me and you've been watching them happen all around you, and you've studied what has gone on in the Roman Empire, or for me, for example, I've spent the last seven or so years just doing nothing but talking about uh, revolutionary breakdowns, transformations, uh, how whole societies go through political, economic, and social upheavals. And having seen so many of these before, this is the, the idea that we could live through something that is going to be possibly as historically what feels unprecedented, but is really not unprecedented. Having a quiver full of historical anecdotes and historical uh, events that we can point to and say, well, this is sort of how these things play out. Um, that's incredibly useful. And I hope that people will um, take a look at what has happened in the history books, because we are going to need something like a blueprint here going forward. This episode is sponsored by Vroom. With Vroom, you can buy a car entirely online and have it delivered straight to you, so you never have to go to a dealership again. We've all heard those car dealership horror stories. A weekend wasted in the finance department, a car that broke down right after someone bought it and drove it off the lot. Don't spend your weekend driving to dealerships or meeting up with strangers. You can browse thousands of cars in one place with Vroom. Plus, you never have to haggle or negotiate the price of a car. And when you sell your car on Vroom, you get a price instantly, so you don't have to waste time with dealerships or flaky buyers. Vroom is entirely online. So next time you need to buy a car, just grab your phone and check out thousands of great cars at Vroom.com. Vroom.com. Now, a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. We don't pay nearly enough attention to it, but our minds need intentional care and attention. We have to invest time in keeping them healthy. Therapy is a great way to keep your mind in order. Just talking through your feelings and your problems with someone who can give you some perspective, help you get out of your own head, is incredibly valuable. 
BetterHelp is online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat-only therapy sessions, so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. Our listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com slash Tides. That's BetterHelp.com slash Tides. When we're thinking about the current moment, like, we've been living in an eternal present for a really long time. I don't know if it's since 9-11 or since the end of the Soviet Union, but it feels like as big moments as there have been, so something like 9-11 is a really big deal, I don't feel like it fundamentally altered the limits of the possible in quite the way that this particular moment is. Like, there are proposals that are going around right now. There are things that governments are doing that would have seemed crazy even a few months ago. And now it's just like, oh, no, that's what we have to do to make our way through the crisis. The limits of the possible are being shifted in in really profound ways that I don't think we've seen, like, maybe since the end of the Cold War. I mean, I think this is probably the moment of quickest and most profound change in like 30 years. No, I would say that that's entirely true. I mean, we're about the same age. I think we're both like elder millennial cohorts, uh, you know, like Oregon Trail generation types where what I have lived through, you know, I was talking about this with my wife that what 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 were the big moments that we've lived through so far? OK, the, the end of the Cold War, check, 9-11, check. And the financial crisis of 2008, 2009, which people try have tried to bury and say that that actually wasn't as big of a deal as it was. But if you're ben, if you're below a certain age, it's one of the most important things that's ever happened uh, in our lifetimes. And if you're above a certain age, you're just like, wow, that was crazy. That thing that happened a while ago that didn't wind up infecting me that much. But I can honestly say that this has been more impactful at, on what I would say is domestic American politics and then domestic, like I live in Europe now, I live in France. So I have a little bit of a different perspective on this, but it's happening here too. Things that, as you say, weren't even thinkable six weeks ago are suddenly things that we have to do. And the difference here is that 9-11 was a hugely transformative event, but we pushed that transformation onto the Middle East. That's what the United States did. It's like we were affected by this thing. Some buildings came down, some people died. And then the United States of America projected massive. All of this that we're talking about has already happened 10, 15, 20 fold to Syria, to Iraq, to Jordan, to Egypt, the entire Arab Spring, followed by everything that's happening over there. We projected that elsewhere. Um, This is the first time that we've watched something like this then actually consume the United States at home, as opposed to being able to just fob it off on somebody else, which is what we usually do. We usually lash out at other people uh, and make them deal with the brunt of our own fears and insecurities. That's one of the things about being an imperial power, which the United States is in the 21st century by basically any definition, is domestic crises usually have worldwide effects. I mean, so in terms of what we're dealing with here in the, in the, the midst of this pandemic, it's not just the pandemic, right? Like, I think it, we got to establish that right off the bat. It's not just the wave of disease. It's the ways in which that is interacting with already ongoing trends. So we were already headed for something like an economic downturn. But when you add a huge exogenous shock to that, it's going to have enormous ripple effects. Like there are more people out of work right now. There are more jobless claims at any time since the Great Recession. Nothing You have never had in the entire history of the United States since they've started tracking unemployment, this many people out of work this fast. So, I mean, it's like we're living through some combination of the Spanish flu and the Great Depression, just with much lower death tolls, but potentially as great an economic disruption. And you're exactly right. The, that the virus itself is the shock to the system that is revealing how much the quote unquote recovery since 2008 has been. I mean, it's it's a bit of a sham. It was very, very papered over because I I think that when we look back, when historians, you know, 50, 100 years, 200 years from now, look back, this event and the recession of 2008 are going to be inextricably linked to each other. They won't be considered Mm -hmm. separate Mm -hmm. events at all. One will be considered the prelude to the other. Because what happened after 2008 is the rise of the gig economy 
for example, mm-hmm. right? Where, yes, people had jobs, but they were incredibly precarious jobs. All of the sort of good, stable jobs with benefits and regularity, uh, where you were actually, you know, the employee of a company as opposed to just being some uh, hired contract worker through a bunch of uh, legal mumbo jumbo that tells you that if you're actually working full-time for Uber, you're not actually a full-time employee for Uber. And this was to create flexibility and and to, you know, let's make things w- much more fluid. And the kids today, what they what they what they don't want to be tied down to a single job. They don't want health care. You know, they just want to be able to move and shake and get their hustle on. And you're like, that's, that's really not what anybody wanted. I mean, some people, of course, at certain times in their life, you know, might want that. But in the main, what people want is stable, regular income uh, with health care and the ability to buy homes and start families, all the very normal stuff that humans have always wanted to do. And we came out of the 2008 recession with wages utterly stagnant, jobs existing, but in incredibly precarious ways that, yeah, this thing, I mean, this is not the feather that's blowing anything over. This isn't the straw that's breaking the camel's back in the sense that th- this is a pretty big, you know, lead weight that just got thrown onto the back of the camel. But it, something was going to happen and something was going to expose how just fundamentally built out of straw all of this was. And even though you could turn on CNBC or you could turn on you know, Fox Business Channel and they'll be talking about how great the stock market is doing, none of that was reflective of what people's actual lived experience was. Mm-hmm. And what we're finding out right now is that people's lived experiences were incredibly precarious and that the this right here, having something that is as crazy as people just having to stay in their homes for a little while is just, just going to destroy the global economy. Yeah, I mean, finally, since 2008, we've reached peak service economy. Right. And in a service economy, you have a massive percentage of people who are dependent on small transactions that are carried out repeatedly, right? And now that everybody is stuck at home, you cannot carry out those small transactions repeatedly because they are not absolutely essential. You can't just pop on down to the convenience store to get a pack of cigarettes. Like that's the, that this kind of stuff that's the, the actual basis for most people's lived experience of the economy, what they do on a day-to-day basis, that's what the economy is. It's people buying and selling things a bajillion times a day. That's what the economy is. And right now you have a demand side shock to the economy because people cannot do that. It's impossible to do that. But also that's not going to go away. Like now that you've created the shock, the shock doesn't go away the moment we declare victory over the pandemic. We've now created this situation where there's been an interruption to the normal flow of business. Tons of people are out of work. Tons of businesses will have gone under by the time this is all said and done. And so this creates a new baseline, at least in the United States, the way that we've handled this, where the jobless claims have risen the way that they have, you can't just snap the economy back to what it was before. Like this has created a split and we'll have to see where it leads, but we have to understand understand that something is going to be different in the aftermath. There is no just turning the clock back to pre-pandemic. Right. And this is the, you know, this is my fear, of course. And we're, um, you know, we're, we've been let out of the the cage that we put ourselves in, uh, in terms of just <laughs> staying out of contemporary politics, because there's really, there's two choices here in front of us as we respond to this. Because first of all, this isn't going anywhere anytime soon. You know, th- this could be years long that we're enduring this. Is who's going to get the political power and what are they going to do with political power in this moment of re imprinting? And sure, somebody like me could say, well, this is really obvious, you know, 30 million people just, you know, lost their jobs. And the United States runs this crazy system where your health care is tied to your job. Well, this is really easy. We will now have, you know, Medicare for all or some kind of national health care system that just completely removes this weird historical quirk of the United States, which is health care being tied to your job. And we'll just take care of this. And this will be the moment we do that. Um, we also have, you know, if we're going to live in this society where everybody is doing these uh, these gig jobs, these Uber jobs, or everybody's a contract worker, if we're going to live this way, okay, maybe there's some kind of universal basic income we need to be talking about so that everybody can at least mm-hmm. afford some place to live, get food, you know, it's just like a real a basic sort of socialization of the risks of society so that nobody, everybody has a nice cushion in case these things sort of like happen. That is, of course, all I think very nice and good, and it's what I would want. But there's also, you know, looming uh, uh, the threat of authoritarian nationalism. 
coming back. Mm -hmm. And all of this can go in a completely different direction where they go, okay, well, you know, we've got these creepy foreign viruses coming in from creepy foreigners. So I guess that means we're just going to close all the borders for all time. There won't be any kind of help for the lower classes. It will just be like, okay, well, they're utterly precarious and who really cares about that? Let's just reconsolidate our own power at the very, very top. These elites that this is what they did after 2008, you know, here in Europe, the push towards austerity in the wake of this massive financial crisis, which is telling everybody we need to tighten our belts. There was a massive demand side problem in 2008. And instead of, you know, doing some uh, counter cyclical spending to pump money back into the economy to get everybody up and running again, they did austerity, they cut social services. And now we're dealing with the secondary impact of that, which is a second major crisis now operating inside of post a decade of austerity. Um, you know, the Britain's National Health Services has been, you know, really taken down to its uh, to its rickety core as a result of 2008. And now they're dealing with this. And what happens coming out of that? Do we fix it or do, you know, basically do the, the proto fascists get a hold of everything and just lock onto it with both of their iron hands? Yeah, because this is something that I want to get into more as we go through the course of this. But one possible outcome here is you like you like those social services, you like that safety net, but you just define very narrowly who gets them. exactly. So like one term for that hair and Volk democracy, if you want to put it in ethno national terms, where you have a pretty generous welfare-ish state, but it's only for a specific group of people who meet the criteria. So if you want to put it in institutional terms, you or uh, or economic terms, you have general rules and identity rules. And that is a system in which state benefits are applied based on identity rules. It'd be like Jim Crow, but with uh, Medicare. Right. And they're already, I mean, the they've been coming for soil citizenship. Uh, basically, if you're born in the United States, you're automatically a citizen. They've been coming after that for 20, 25 years. And I could very easily see them saying, Oh yeah, in in those terms, yeah. If you're just if you if somebody makes it to the United States and they have a baby, that kid shouldn't now be able to access our generous benefits that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And as we move forward, are there going to be future pandemics? Yes, but the main thing looming on the horizon here, well, not looming on the horizon, it's already happening, is climate change. And climate change is going to cause enormous disruptions to where populations are able to live. It is going to cause new migrations uh, around the globe as climate shift and people have to move with it. I think you're going to have major pressure put on these systems. And if they do go the way of sort of closed minded Heron Volk democracy style uh, nationalism, then you're going to have mass groups who are cut out from all of that, who are really, really just, they're exposed to everything. They're going to be exposed to wildfires. They're going to be exposed to uh, pandemic viruses, and they're not going to have any access to anything. So how we respond to this is going to be very, very critical. And there are different ways that we can go. I'm, to be honest, I mean, it's tough to look at what is happening right now and be thoroughly optimistic about how we're going to handle this going forward, especially given uh, the leadership for example, of the United States of America, you know, we just watched in Wisconsin them, uh, uh, they forced through uh, the primary election in where Milwaukee went from having 180 polling sites uh, and they took it down to five polling sites. There's a real threat right now in the United States that elections will simply cease to be considered legitimate. And that's really mm -hmm. scary. Yeah. So this is, I, I want to save that particular bit for the end. So where, where are we going with this? What are the possible plausible scenarios that we see coming out of this? Because that's something we have to think about is like, is democracy going to continue to be a viable political system for the United States? Is the United States itself going to continue to exist? This is all stuff I want to get into. Before we get there real quick, is there a moment that this reminds you of? Like, because you, you spent the last seven years talking about revolutions. You spent the last the six, seven years before that looking at the history of Rome. Like, is there a particular moment that this reminds you of? Yeah, I was answering some questions on Twitter the other day and somebody asked me that basically that same question. And I just sort of popped off and said, this reminds me of 1848, the revolutions of 1848. And then I didn't elaborate it. I didn't elaborate on it at all. So I will elaborate on this now. I can't really uh, try to explain right now succinctly everything that happened in 1848 in 30 seconds. But if you don't know, there was a massive 
upswing of revolutionary, basically for liberal democracy throughout France and Germany and Austria and Italy and uh, the Habsburg areas where you know my uh, nationalities inside of these various sort of lingering uh, European empires were fighting for autonomy and independence and then uh, various domestic groups were often fighting for democracy and then these proto-proletarian labor classes who were coming out of what was at that point the early what we now consider the early industrial revolution who were fighting for things like bread and wages and the right to work so all of those things got put into a hopper in 1848 and it was this massive explosion that went on through europe for about 18 months but what strikes me about this so clearly is the couple of years that led up to 1848 the revolutions of 1848 which really started with the potato famine and we, lots of people do know the potato famine, uh, especially its impact in Ireland. But it was the, just the potato blight. Everybody was eating potatoes. It was a staple of everybody's diet. And suddenly all the potatoes were turning to mush and you couldn't eat them anymore. And the effect that this had beyond just the massive famine. So, so the, we're going to call the potato famine like the coronavirus, where millions of people died as a result of these famines. And there was mass disruption uh, all across northern Europe. But it also had these knock-on effects. Where mm-hmm. suddenly uh, the collapse of the collapse of potatoes, there was also uh, ter- some terrible harvests that happened at the same time. So like rye suddenly was no good, and you, you, they were having trouble growing wheat, and so the price of food skyrocketed. 1845, 1846, 1847, the price of, of food started going through the roof, and what it did is it was eating up everybody's household budget. So the middle classes and the upper classes, too, they could feed themselves. They weren't dying of famine, but like all of their money, all of, all of the wages that they were making, all of their salaries were going towards just putting food on the table. And this meant that they did not have money for things like pants or fancy cookware or silk, or they weren't, maybe they were thinking about building a new house and suddenly they're not going to build a new house anymore. And so there was a huge recession that was caused by this. There was no social safety net at this point. So when orders stopped coming in to various factories and various, uh, you know, like cottage industry type work, people would just be laid off. Suddenly there's just you're not able to make that money anymore. And that is sending more people out there with even less money. They're not making as much money as they were before, just as the price of even bread and simple uh, staples to live is going through the roof. Now you've got a business recession that has been caused by this. The factories are shutting down. This run, then runs into what was at that point railroad mania, which is everybody had been building railroads all through the 1830s and 1840s. It causes a massive collapse in the stock of railroad building across Europe and in the, in the United States and in Canada. And that created a financial panic. So two years after the potato famine, you're now dealing with a massive financial panic where people are, you know, there's there's bank runs. The early stock exchanges are all collapsing. Uh, States suddenly can't get revenue for their taxes. And this feeds right into early 1848 when what happens? One of the biggest revolutionary moments that struck all of Europe that went from uh, went from Paris all the way to Budapest. And so that sort of cycle of events where it's triggered by this simple potato blight in 1845 and 1846, that by 1848, the results had been recession, angry workers, out of work, starving peasants, middle classes who were pissed off because suddenly they used to kind of have these nice lives and now they don't. So that that is how I see, you know, when, when people ask me, you know, what does this remind you of? Do, I mean, does it remind me of when the United States broke away from Great Britain? Not really. Does it remind me of um, Europe in 1847? Yeah, yeah, quite a bit. Yeah, because you have essentially an exogenous shock that's channeling all of these systemic weaknesses, problems, and points of friction. So if you have a whole bunch of really precarious people who are uprooted from their communities working in factories and proto-factories who are then suddenly laid off while disconnected from the networks that kept them rooted and centered as members of society, you inject a good deal of political instability into the mix. Boom, you've got some revolutions. That to me is the biggest parallel with 1848 because I think it makes a lot of sense is that the cracks and things that came out through those revolutions already existed. They were already there. The kind of fault lines in society, the political ideologies that end up blossoming in 1848, it's not that they came out of nowhere. They were all pre-existing. It's just that they were kind of supercharged by the exogenous shock. Exactly. And I think in the same way that you were talking earlier about how the, you know, the unthinkable suddenly becomes thinkable when, uh, just to focus, for example, on France, when they're suddenly dealing with all of these laid off workers who are super pissed off. 
who literally need to eat. They need wages to live, but the factories aren't up and running. You know, there's no work to be had. This is when the right to work becomes an idea. And the French government opens up national workshops, right? And this is the first time that anybody, I mean, this is basically work for welfare, which was a, a way to just have people come in and you would literally just dig a ditch for a couple of uh, a franc per day. And that was an idea that had been unthinkable. What are we going to do? We're just going to, we're going to have the state pay people to do jobs, even though the jobs are pointless. Um, well, yeah, when everybody's starving to death, yeah, you need to start thinking creatively about how you're going to handle this. And one of the biggest then conflicts, at least in the French side of 1848, was that the people who won, quote unquote, won the revolution of 1848, these um, these kind of like radical Democrats, they weren't actually committed to the idea of just paying people to do work. They wanted capitalism to work. They wanted the free market to do its thing. They didn't want all of these people to just get paid just because they were alive. So for them, the national workshops were this very, very short term thing. Um, that they did not want to keep going. And then as soon as they could, they basically, they set them up to fail. And then as soon as they could shut them down, they did. And that created a second revolution in June. The first revolution was in February, 1848. And then there was a second one in June that involved a lot of um, bloody repression of the working classes who were just thrown back out into the streets. You know, thanks a lot. Good luck out there. And they rose up in an attempt to fight for the right to essentially feed themselves and were kind of mercilessly crushed by the Second Republic. One of the things that has come out in in seeing you talk about this and thinking about your perspective on this is, you know, revolutions over the long run is how fast things can sometimes happen. So you just mentioned there February to what was the when was the second one? In June. Yeah. So February to June. That's not that long. That's four months. In the French Revolution, how long is it from the tennis court oath to a constitutional monarchy? Oh, uh, well, that one took a little bit longer. Uh, but they, they, but no, I take your point that, the, you know, they got together in the original French Revolution. They got together in mm-hmm. May of 1789 to basically mm-hmm. address a financial crisis. You know, the, the monarchy mm-hmm. doesn't have enough money. So let's figure out a way to get them some money. And yeah, six weeks later, they're like, Mark, you were con- we have a constitution now, um, which nobody mm-hmm. nobody saw coming, and you know the the revolutions of eighteen forty eight too. Nobody saw it coming even in February. It was a it was a very quick rapid fire thing that was triggered by some people wanting um, a, a, an increase in democratic suffrage, where mm-hmm. the July monarchy had. Uh, which was the regime that was overthrown in 1848, they had voting. There was an assembly of delegates. There was something resembling representative government, but the electorate was was very, very small and, and based on very, very high uh, minimum property requirements. And so there had been for the few years going into that a movement towards increasing the number of voters, right? A, like a democratic suffrage mm-hmm. movement that was just agitating for the right to vote when just everything went to hell all of a sudden in February of 1848 that n- neither the people who wound up staging the revolution nor the regime expected. But that one was so fast that like on a Monday, nobody expected anything to happen. And by Thursday, they're declaring a republic. There is an extent to which that reminds me of the current situation where Andrew Yang talking about a universal basic income a few months ago was like, OK, you know, you're like you've got your supporters, but that seems fairly out there. And now universal basic income is a thing that's popping up all over the place as a solution to the ongoing crisis. Right. I mean, the things that Bernie Sanders has been saying for years is suddenly, you know, he was he was supposed to be this just wild outside all bounds of, of acceptable political thinking, what is normal. And now. All of a sudden, yeah, you you might actually have to just do these things in order to solve the crisis that is right in front of your face. And that's that's the thing is we're dealing with something that nobody has had to face before. And so many of the things that people really struggle with is when for years and years people say, oh, well, someday this is going to happen. So we need to do this or someday this is going to happen. So we need to do that. You're always thinking to yourself, yeah, okay, but it's never actually going to happen. And then now we're living through it. Now the thing that many people have been warning about for years and years and years, up to and including a mass pandemic, you know, we all read The Stand when we were kids. Um, I I don't know. Did you read The Stand when you were a kid? I never read Uh, The Stand. Yeah. Okay. Well, so in The Stand and, you know, I was I was a I liked Stephen King when I was a teenager. um, 
And he used to talk about this, you know, back in the 80s and 90s, like his biggest fear is, you know, one of these global pandemics. So it's always kind of in the back of your mind that something like this is just going to rip through the population and maybe we should, you know, prepare for it and plan for it. But there's also that part of your brain that thinks, oh, well, that won't actually ever happen. So we don't have to do any of the things that would might make us uncomfortable today or don't seem necessary today because it might be inconvenient, which I think, again, is the same thing that we're facing with climate change. There's a lot mm-hmm. of things we could be doing right now that would make the impact of climate change quite a bit less severe as it's coming down the pipe. But, you know, this whole business of like, oh, in 20 years or 30 years, climate change is going to be a problem. No, that was true 20 or 30 years ago. Like, it's a problem. It's a problem right now. And we need to be facing it right now. And people still aren't facing it right now. Right now, in the United States, the the whole world's on in lockdown. And there are states out there that are just like, nah, we're not going to do that. That's crazy. You guys are crazy. So if you can't get people to even go into lockdown when the entire world is is facing exactly the same thing in a major moment, then, you know, God, God help us all. <laughs> yeah, that thought has occurred to me more than once over the past few days, the way in which this is a dress rehearsal for climate change and some places are doing a lot better than others in the midst of that dress rehearsal. That thought has occurred to me. Imagine having one extra day every week, more time to cook healthy meals, work on that novel, or just binge some good TV. I'd probably spend more time reading books or playing with my kids. Now, that's all possible with ClickUp, the productivity platform that'll save you one day a week on work, guaranteed. ClickUp began with the premise that productivity was broken. There were too many tools to keep track of, too many things in entirely separate ecosystems. ClickUp is the one tool to house all your tasks, projects, docs, goals, spreadsheets, and more. It's built for teams from one to a thousand or more. It's packed with features and customization options that no other productivity tool has, so you can work the way that you work best. Join the more than 800,000 highly productive teams using ClickUp today. Use code TIDESPOD to get 15% off ClickUp's massive unlimited plan for a year, meaning you can start reclaiming your time for under $5 a month. Sign up today at ClickUp.com and use code TIDESPOD. Hurry, this offer ends soon. Hey everyone, it's MSNBC's Tremaine Lee. Have you listened to my podcast, Into America? Each week, I explore what it means to be black in America, like the toll racism can take on mental health, the fight against fascism, and how history shapes our lives today. I hope you'll search for Into America wherever you're listening right now. And hit that follow button. New episodes drop every Thursday. Catch you then. One of the things this reminds me of as we're doing all of, all of this talking about is social safety net and the ways in which you can use the state essentially to backstop and or mitigate the effect of disasters like this is the New Deal, which is revolutionary, but it is not a revolution. And how the New Deal is basically a deal struck to prevent that, uh, to prevent kind of raucous, riotous social upheaval. It's like the American political elites, especially conservative ones, were not stoked about doing these things. They were not happy about it. And they spent, you know, the several decades after that trying to break the New Deal consensus and then finally succeeded. It's not like they were happy about doing that. It was just the price that was necessary to pay to get through the Great Depression and then to bargain with the populace for mass mobilization warfare in World War II. Right. And that moment, like that New Deal moment when, you know, they're facing and they'd been they had been in the Great Depression for years before FDR even Mm -hmm. came to power. I mean, we often think of like the Great Depression happened. Hoover was president for a year and then FDR came to power. It really wasn't that at all. America had been enduring it for quite some time. And as you said, especially in Europe, the Weimar Republic, et cetera, you're, you're dealing with, you know, you got Nazis and fascists on one side and you've got Bolsheviks and communists on the other. And I do think that it's true that in the United States, enough of the political elite rallied to the idea that if we do do something, you know, I mean, FDR didn't overturn capitalism. FDR saved capitalism. Um, that's that's mm-hmm. what the New Deal was attempting to do, was to stave off the fascists on the one hand or the Bolsheviks on the other. And I think it was largely successful. Although, as you said, there was that core 
who despised everything, who think that the New Deal is a betrayal of the American ideal and the American identity. And they haven't stopped trying to undo the New Deal in 1968 or 1972 when they started actually breaking the New Deal, the political faction that was the New Deal consensus, the the Democrats uh, basically controlling the federal government there for a good 30 years. Uh, They're still trying to do it now. Even in the midst of everything we're looking at right now, they're always trying to slash social programs and cut taxes. And we're now dealing, I think, that that to the extent that there is a backlash that is happening, which there is, because that's something we haven't talked about, is that, you know, you say a lot of things were already floating around out there before this event kicks them off out there. I mean, 2019, it's hard to remember now, but 2019 was defined in many ways by mass populist protests across the mm-hmm. globe in Hong Kong, in Peru, in you know Venezuela, in the United States. Uh, I mean, MAGA Trumpism is something of a of a um, of a version of this. Brexit is a version of this. I live here in Paris. Um, the Gilets Jaunes were a part of this, and then it rolled right into the general strike, right? Which is something we, we in Paris here we went directly from the city being kind of crippled by a general strike and a transportation strike right into being on twenty three hour a day lockdown. It's it's been a very strange time in Paris. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it's fun to live through history. But the globe really saw a lot of populist uprisings all through 2019. And I don't think that those are going to go anywhere. And most of that, I think, is caused by and a reaction to what was the mass reaction to like the New Deal and the post and in Europe, at least the post World War Two sort of social democratic arrangement that is, I think, the same way that the New Deal was set up to, again, combat fascism and communism. Coming out of World War II, I think most of Western Europe cut the same deal between elites and the general population to fight the Cold War economically and socially, mm-hmm. where, okay, we'll give you benefits and we'll give you a strong welfare state, but but please let's not do communism. And then we really saw once, once sort of the West, quote unquote, won the Cold War, then you saw really how quickly they went to start dismantling all of those social safety nets and all of that social democracy that had built up for 50 or 60 years. They rushed in there to dismantle it as soon as they could. And that is where we are right now. We're dealing with the aftermath, not of the New Deal and social democracy being built up, but what happens when it gets taken apart. Yeah, we are clearly living through end stage neoliberalism. And like, I know that there are a lot of people that are like, what's neoliberalism? That's just a term. No, neoliberalism is an actual thing. It is an actual set of ideologies that focus around the privatization of formerly public state functions, cuts to the welfare state, an emphasis on the use of markets to solve problems. Like, it's a real thing. There are particular sets of ideas about monetary policy that tend but do not always go along with that and exemplified by figuring years like Thatcher and Reagan and then the third way center leftists of the 90s. So Clinton and Tony Blair, those are the main figures of neoliberalism. So that's when we talk about it, that's that's more or less what it is. Does that sound about right? To yeah. You? And I think that that's essentially been the prevailing ideology of my lifetime. Yeah. If you are a child of the 80s, you are a fish swimming in neoliberal waters. And like so many of these assumptions seem so basic that it's almost hard to imagine a different way of doing it. And that's how you know it's a real thing. That's how you know it's real ideology, uh, as they say. So I think it's fairly clear that we're living through the end stage of that system. And and it's a question of what's going to be next, because this doesn't seem especially tenable to me. So either what happens after this has to be a more generous state backstopping of social services or a pure you're on your own type of thing. And both of those come with their risks and their trade-offs, especially if you're a member of a political elite. Like, do you want to just give the poor something so they don't rise up? Or do you want to kind of lean into repression? It seems like those are kind of the options. Right. And I think that that is what we're looking at here, watching how they responded to 2008 with austerity and belt tightening and the way that the European Union treated Greece, you know, all of these things don't speak well of what their initial responses are going to be. Although I will say, you know, here in France, there were some of these, uh, you know, sort of arch neoliberal figures who were the 
part-time architects of austerity in the European Union and here in France who were pushing for all of these things for more privatization because you know France is uh, this this clunky sclerar thing that was that was all tied down by too many regulations and labor laws and they wanted to just loosen the whole thing up that's what the, that's what the strike was all about is they want to reform the pension system and people don't want the pension system reform that's the fundamental conflict and you know these guys right now yes yeah eight weeks ago they were trying to um ram uh changing retirement benefits down everybody's throats and right now they're like yeah okay we're not actually doing that and we're gonna actually um we're gonna do a bunch of things that are basically counter to our own ideology just to get us through this uh this crisis so there is some hope that maybe people will wake up to what they've been doing and how far societies can actually be pushed before they break down there's only so much you can extract out of something before you have to say, okay, well, maybe I have enough and I need to leave something for other people. Because that's also a part of neoliberal ideology is the belief in just the the complete, uh, the untrammeled ability of any one person to, uh, to acquire as much wealth and capital as they possibly can. And that if they do those things, whatever they did to acquire that much money must be a good social thing. So whether it's Bill Gates or Mark Zuckerberg or... Um, uh, or Jeff Bezos, these guys created Amazon, Microsoft, Facebook. I, I, I'm still struggling with what exactly Facebook is doing for us that <laughs> earns Mark Zuckerberg that much money. I mean, I get it. It's the now the the global communications array is, is what it turned into. But the idea that they need to be able to make that much that much money without any kind of check in order to have the great things that we have. You know, Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs made a bunch of money and we all have iPhones. That's sort of the idea that they have going for him. But um, right now, I think people are, um, you know, Zoom is great and uh, their computers are great, but bread is also good. People need to eat. People need to be able to pay their rent. And uh, if, if people can't pay their rent and people can't afford food, then maybe you've extracted too much from the society that you're sitting on top of. And this is something that I feel it's really it's really important to emphasize is the, the feeling that I get when I talk to people who are well educated historically, whether they're professional historians or just kind of interested amateurs, whether they're people who do what you and I do or academics or just people who like history. I think the sense that I get from talking to them after having pulled a whole bunch is that we're much closer to the edge of a breakdown in this particular moment than I think our political elites, especially in the United States, are are realizing that there's there are some very real dangers of social breakdown and political breakdown, like systemic, systemic breakdowns that can come about as a result of this. Like there are distinct imaginable paths that take us from where we're sitting right here today to the collapse of our political system or the collapse of some really important social functions over the coming months and years. Oh. Like that is no longer out of the realm of possibility. Yeah, sure. It could, yeah, we, it could be ball game time by November, you know, mm -hmm. and my struggle as I continue to encounter the world that everybody else encounters is that I have spent the last 13 years talking a lot about how civilizations crumble and fall apart and what happens mm -hmm. when that when things start to fall apart you know the first book i wrote was about the collapse of the roman republic you know what are the things that led up to the collapse of this institution that existed for 500 years that nobody nobody thought was going to go anywhere nobody they they were all totally um convinced that the republic was an eternal was an eternal state then fell apart within a couple of generations and then doing revolutions each season is me a, taking some society that was existing in some form that people generally had the notion well this is what it is you know ancien regime france or czarist russia this is how we do things this is how we've always done things things aren't going to change even though none of that was true right like people had mm -hmm. the ancien regime france such as it was really only got going with like louis the 14th it's not like it was some 2,000-year-old timeless institution. It was like 100 years old when it was overthrown. But the point being that everywhere I look, I see signs. I see things that I could put into an episode of the Revolutions podcast about our current present moment. Like, this is really easy. Oh, here's Trump. He's fighting with the governors. Um, this, is, this is an episode of a podcast about a revolution or some kind of social collapse in the United States where the feuding between the governors and 
the president the, and that institutional battle, which is a real thing that's happening right now. And, it, and it's actually vital what's what's occurring because we're talking about who's getting necessary funding and supplies to combat this killer virus, this virus that is actually killing human beings. Um, how are we going to combat this? And it seems like You know, the governors are saying that the president is absolutely abdicating his responsibility and the president is saying, well, you should have taken care of it yourselves. And there's so much bickering that, I mean, when when does that start to fray apart? Uh, When when does California take its tax revenue and go home if they're not going to get the support of the federal government that they want? So I'm primed to see all of this and I accept that. And so when I when I go around either here today or on Twitter and I seem somewhat alarmist <laughs> like all the time uh, and I'm constantly saying like, you know, we, we need to do vote by mail or you're literally talking about the end of American democracy. I sometimes can't tell if I'm just so primed for this that I see it everywhere or if I've seen it so much that I'm seeing it here now and it's true. Also, I've been in my apartment 23 hours a day. Um, for the last couple of weeks. So I, I am not entirely sure where my head is at any given moment. So I identify very strongly with all of that because I've spent my entire adult life studying uh, breakdown yeah. in some way, shape or form. So yeah, I too think that I'm primed to see it. Like I was explaining to my three and a half year old son what I was working on the other day. He came up to me as I was typing on my computer and I told him I was writing about the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V. And he's like, well, was he a good guy or a bad guy? Um, I'm like, I don't think he was a real good guy. So my son is like, oh, he's okay. So he's a bad guy. And he's like, is it a sad story or a happy story? And I'm like, well, I don't think it's a happy story. So my son then walks away, goes to my wife and he says, daddy's job is writing sad stories about bad people. (laughs) And I was like, that's not, that's that's not not entirely wrong. That's not wrong. (laughs) He's not wrong at all. So trust me, I, I feel you as far as the being primed to see this stuff goes. But I also think like... The flip side to that is that you're, if you have spent your life thinking that you live in a stable political system, it may be extremely difficult for you to see the signs of instability as they've come up. To properly place disruptive events in the correct context, whether that's temporal or thematic, like to see these events as related to one another over the course of time, like that you have to draw connections. If you're trying to understand the modern political history of the United States, for example, you have to draw straight lines from the impeachment of Clinton to Bush v. Gore to Bush Kerry to the Tea Party to 2016 to the present day. You have to understand that all of those things are part of the same story, but if you just view them as discrete events that you weren't paying that much attention to as they happen or of which your memory has been shaped by subsequent events in some in some specific way, you have to understand that that's the story and that those are things that add up to systemic challenges to a particular way of doing politics. And so so if you happen to be, you know, the political elite of an opposition party in the year of our Lord 2020 and the political headspace that you're occupying belongs to the era before all of that happened, then maybe you're not especially well equipped to combat the present crisis. Yes, yes. One might tend to agree with that analysis personally, <laughs> but here but, but here we are and we're going to ride or die. But. <laughs> you know, it, it is really true. And there there is this is one of the problems of um, of having an aged leadership where there is this crazy thing. And you're talking about things that are connected to each other. Like if, if you were going to sit down and write like what what is happening right now, one of the things that's happening is that um, there have been some amazing advancements in modern medicine. And that these amazing advancements in modern medicine have allowed people, especially wealthy people who can access this stuff to just kind of stay alive and stay healthy. And so suddenly in the United States of America, we've got a bunch of 80 year olds who are running to be president of the United States. And you look at who's running the Senate and you look at the House of Representatives everywhere you see it's it's like a lot of old people and people who are older baby boomers. It's not even like young baby boomers. It's like older baby boomers are still running everything. And these are people whose worldviews and whose um, encounters with the world were shaped by fundamentally different events than the events that are currently shaping the globe. And so there is a strong pull to want to go back to the way that things were before. That's a huge part of what MAGA is all about. I mean, it's make America great again in that sense, you know, going back to it's all mythological, of course. But that sort of sentimental attachment to the way that things used to be has a powerful pull, but it makes you completely ill-equipped to actually deal with the world that you live in. 
And this didn't just by virtue of the fact that medicine didn't used to be this good and that when you got to be 60 years old or, you know, you started to kind of get run down, even if you didn't keel over and die, you couldn't certainly keep up the pace of a, of a presidential schedule. Not that our current president keeps up the pace of a, of a presidential schedule, uh, but a Roman consul was, was 42 years old, people who were, who were in their primes, not just people who were really ought to be giving advice to the people who are running the show. And so I think that there is a huge generational split right now where something that we're facing is an aged leadership who's just simply not seeing what it is that they need to do in these current times. Yeah. And like to be clear, this is not an argument against having aged people in your political elite. It's an argument against kind of a sclerotic political system that doesn't have any room for people whose experiences are different and whose political views might vary according to the things that they've seen in the in the world that they've experienced. So this is a thing. We, it's been a joke. It's been a meme for years and years and years. Millennials, anybody who's younger than us, I think we're at the oldest possible edge of this. I just turned 40, where the lifetime wealth accumulation of people above the age of 40 versus below the age of 40 is stark, right? Like what, mm-hmm. whether or not you can afford to buy a home, whether or not you have property, whether or not you can afford to raise a family, like all of these really basic questions. People who are over the age of 40 are doing significantly better than people under the age of 40. And this is mostly by people over the age of 40 boiled down to like avocado toast and all of these like lifestyle choices that millennials have made. And if they, you know, if they didn't do this or do that, may well, you know, if, if, you know, if you just saved a little bit more, you know, I put myself through four years of college working an ice cream stand seven hours a week. Um, yeah, you could do that in 1960. You could do that in 1970 before y'all pull back all of the subsidizing of the university systems that used to allow you to pay for four years of college working in an ice cream shop, which you can't do that anymore. Yeah, because it's not a matter of like what TV shows you watched as a child. It's a matter of the material circumstances of your world being fundamentally different as a result of things that have happened. Right. And the things that have happened to people under the age of 40 are significantly different than the things that have happened to people over the age of 40, because most of us graduated into like I I was in college right when the dot com bubble hit so it was like 911 there was a dot com bubble um rolled right into the beginning of endless wars that were uh, that again one of those times that we pushed all of our angst and all of our fear and all of our dread onto other people instead of actually enduring it ourselves and then we rolled right into the great recession which decimated anybody's ability to have a good job uh, save up money, make a good wage, um, have a stable life. And then this, the end state of the Great Recession period, there's now a bracket on that period. It's the period between the Great Recession and the coronavirus. That's now a bracketed part of history. Mm-hmm. We're done with sort of talking about how the recovery from the recession was never that great to begin with for a lot of people, especially young people. That has now been, this has now all been completely blown up by this other, this newest and greatest of all the social crises that have hit me. And I'm 40 years old, and this has been my experience in life. When I grew up, and probably when you grew up, it was through the 80s. It was like, uh, you know, Rocky fights Drago, wins. Then the Berlin Wall comes down. Then we go into the 90s, and everything is great. It, uh, everybody's making a ton of money. Now suddenly there's the internet. It's going to set us all free. And that all came to a screeching halt, like on 9-11, right? This is at least my experience. I'm a, you know, affluent, upper middle class white kid. But if you back it up to people who are 10 or 15 years older than me and then all the way back to my parents, they saw a much different they're, – they're stamped by the Cold War and they had a different expectation for things. And they had – the world worked in a fundamentally different way than it has worked for us and then especially the people who are younger than us. Um, the world has worked very differently for them than it has for the baby boomers. And there's a lot to that. Yeah. I mean, I've tried to explain this to my parents who are very intelligent people. They're both kind of older boomers. And I've tried to get across to them that like there are going to be people who are voting in this next election who were born after 9-11. And I think it's hard for them to wrap their heads around that. And I think it's hard for kind of our political elders to grasp that like the avocado toast eating millennials are not young. Oh, well, yeah, also true. Yeah, they're 30, they're 35 years old, balding with two kids and trying to figure out how on earth they're going to like pay their mortgage. 
I mean, did you have to call me out that hard? Like, that was... Was that a direct? You, you literally read me. Every time I go to the barber now, I see a little more uh, forehead than well. I used to. But that's... We all, we all have yeah. our struggles. Yeah, I mean, it's like, you're not talking about inexperienced children. You're talking about people who are supposed to be entering their peak earning years and who still feel exceptionally precarious. And that that is... Maybe not at this particular moment, but at some point over the next several election cycles, assuming we continue to have elections, is going to end up playing itself out at the ballot box. You can't expect things to stay the same forever. And at some point, you're going to have a generational shift in voting patterns that goes along with that. And that's going to be reflected in the kinds of policies that are pushed. And I think this particular moment is going to be one of those that we look back at as like, okay, this was a turning point. I mean, you see these Mm -hmm. divides between who was voting for Biden and who was voting for Sanders was just, I mean, it couldn't be more obvious. Like, that everybody under the age of 40 is like, yes, d- yes, what that what, what Sanders is saying, yes, more of that, please. And anybody who's older than that is looking at Biden and saying, God, you know, like everything was pretty good until Trump came along and started like insulting people and being kind of crass and vulgar. And we think Trump is very uncouth and we hate him and he's a bore uh, and he's, you know, he abuses women and he's a misogynist and a bully and we can't stand the guy and we want to get rid of him. But we, we want to get rid of him so we can go back to the way that things were when things were nice in 2015. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that there is this whole generational cohort that's coming up that's looking back at 2015 and saying like, well, things weren't great. Then why do you want to go back to that? Mm -hmm. I don't want to go back to that. So we're primed for that. We're we're primed for that kind of generational conflict. And right now, and you know, one of one of the things that comes up over and over again in revolutions is, you know, who who's actually staging these revolutions. It's people who feel mm-hmm. disaffected, disenfranchised, people who don't feel like their voices are being heard, people who don't feel like their concerns and needs are being addressed by the state. You have to want it. Like you have to want change. Uh, and you have to feel like you're not doing well under the not only are you not doing well under the current system, but nothing you can do inside of the current system seems like it's going to actually make things better for you. And that mm-hmm. is where we get to. And you see that in the French Revolution, it's one, it's, you know, it's um, sort of if you take a leftist analysis of it, it's this rising democratic bourgeoisie or it's working classes. There are other interpolate. If you take the the American Revolution, you have all of these planters and, uh, and merchants in the New World who don't feel like uh, their concerns are being addressed by parliament. You know, whoever it is in whatever form it takes, you're going to have a bunch of people who are feeling enormously politically disaffected and especially dealing with a political elite that seems so entrenched and so myopic and so out of touch and so kind of exploitive of the situation and so utterly unwilling to even listen to the idea that things maybe aren't so great and need to change, that that's, that's when you do start to have social breakdown and political breakdown. When you're scrolling through social media, how can you tell what's real? Anything can be posted online without being fact-checked. But if you heard about the secret to permanent weight loss, wouldn't you give it a follow? Tanya Zuckerbrot, founder of the trendy high-fiber F-Factor diet, has celebrity followers including Megyn Kelly and supermodel Olivia Colpo. But allegations of troubling side effects with the diet began to surface, and people started to question, is she selling powder or power? Emily Gellis, a popular fashion influencer, saw these allegations and put the diet on blast to her own large social following. She launched a crusade to expose Tanya and the F-Factor diet. What was once an online feud escalated into the real world, resulting in threats, lawsuits, and a whole lot of drama. From Wondery comes a new series about wealth, wellness, and influence. Listen to Fed Up on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Spotify, or you can listen early and ad-free by joining Wondery Plus in the Wondery app. Yeah, and in the particular context of the United States, this is something you mentioned a little while ago that I wanted to come back to. When you add in a hefty bit of institutional and jurisdictional friction, that helps to create the circumstances that make all of that much more likely than it would otherwise be. So I, I, I DM'd this to you on Twitter, but there was a clip of Gavin Newsom talking in, in which he refers to California as a nation state. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the kind of thing, like not to be flippant about it, like that's, I'm sure that was a pretty intentional choice of words on his part. The governor of California doesn't get up and call his state a nation state without having done some thinking about it. You know what I mean? I do. And I mean, it's one of these things where now currently, I mean, even if you ask me right now, like 
what sort of prompted us to, to even start talking about this is that I think I was looking at feuds between Cuomo and Trump over mm-hmm. how we're we going to get ventilators and how we're we going to get masks and um, what is the federal government actually doing here and Trump fighting back and saying, well, this is all this is all on you and you did a very bad job. And it all feels very personal with Trump because everything is very personal with Trump because um, he just projects his you know narcissistic insecurities onto the world. And so that conflict, if the institution of the presidency, which we have heaped so much power and responsibility onto, that's another thing that's happened really over the course of the 20th century, but even more so in my own lifetime, is the presidency becoming this all, all-encompassing all and all-powerful institution. What happens when that institution really is just simply fundamentally uninterested in doing its job to protect its own citizens? Mm-hmm. And that gets you back to very, very basic brass tacks political theory of like, what is the point of government? What is the point of the state? And you can, over the thousands and thousands of years, going back to, you know, Plato and Aristotle and beyond, of people thinking about what is the role of the state and what power ought it have and what role should it play. At a bare minimum, it's usually something like protect the citizens from death. Um, Whether... (laughs) Whether it's whether it and this this is like why you have an army. So okay, what does the king do? The king mm-hmm. is the head war. He's the chief warrior, is what a king is, right? So if there's a threat, then we let the king and and his warrior buddies go off and fight it and protect us. And that's why they're allowed to have land. That's why they're allowed to be noble. And that's the basic agreement. To the extent that there's a social contract, it's that the government should protect people from death. And if that stops being the case then you know what does the governor of new york or the governor of california feel like they need to do to fulfill their responsibilities to their own citizens and if they're not getting it from the federal government if if the presidency is essentially abdicating its own responsibility to its own citizens which it kind of seems in many ways that trump is then when do they start making political calls that six weeks ago were so unfathomable that they were just not even in the realm of of even fantastical uh, it's something you would see on TV and it wouldn't be a particularly well received because it would just seem kind of silly. But at the same time, I think many, many things are on the table that were not on the table six weeks ago. I still don't think it's going to happen. I think that the ties are mm-hmm. still quite a bit too strong. And then even though I don't totally, you know, I'm not I'm not an economist and I certainly uh, don't have like a like a master's in financial institutions, but it seems like you're not really going to have the, the breaking apart of the states of the United States uh, as long as the Federal Reserve is still a thing, right? Um, because it would just yeah. be too, in, it, you just wouldn't be able to pull it off if you couldn't control monetary policy. Yeah, I agree with you. I think it's gone from a one in a thousand chance to a one in a hundred or a one in 50 kind of chance. Like it's substantially more plausible than it was, but still implausible at this particular moment. That doesn't mean those odds don't change um, given future events, but like it's helpful for a moment to just leave Trump aside because he's such a divisive figure and he's such an all encompassing figure. Like it's not about Trump. It's about the presidents. Yeah. It's about and it's not about the state governors. It's a, it's not about Cuomo or Newsom. It's about the governors. Mm-hmm. It's exactly. about layers of authority and jurisdiction within the kind of creaking federal uh, federalist political system that we have. Right. Like the that's federalism is that you have these multiple layers of authority and oftentimes they're redundant and clunky and make it very difficult to get things done. At other times, like this one, it actually serves the needs of the citizens pretty well because it means that you have redundancies built in to your political system. But if you're in a situation where it seems like the interests of those various branches and levels of authority and jurisdiction are diverging, that also creates a fairly ready-made template for those things to split and to split in some basic and meaningful sense. And to your point about the the Federal Reserve, yeah, the Federal Reserve is... like the United States as a monetary unit is not going anywhere, but there are a lot of layers of potential autonomy and a lot of kind of variations on what the precise relationship between states and municipalities and the federal government can be and what the federal government is and can do that can still adhere even within a system where where you're all using the same currency and you've got the same monetary policy for everyone. Yeah, the European Union. Yeah, great. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the European Union is working great. <laughs> Yeah, because that's 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 yeah. I mean, that's out. working out fantastic for everybody here. It's it's not an optimist's take. I never <laughs> said I was an optimist, man. But yeah, it is like 
that is something I that's always been on my mind. And I think there was probably a point where I overrated the possibility of the United States breaking up simply because I'd spent so long looking at the fall of the Roman Empire yeah. and the ways in which that particular political unit fell apart. But now I'm back to seeing if not the likelihood of it, at least the potential ways in which it could happen. So if you have the governors of various states banding together to decide that they're going to buy PPE to fight this virus together, it's not that far of a step from that to other forms of kind of supra state, but below the level of the federal government cooperation. Yeah, because, you know, when you get away from like what I do with revolutions and going back to Roman history, you go through the crisis of the third century or you go through the the quote unquote fall of, of the Western Empire. A, a lot of the political instability with these people who we would call warlords breaking away, you know, some guy declaring himself Caesar up on the Rhine or, you know, uh, somebody out in Syria declaring themselves to be now independent from the central authorities. I mean, it was happening because of personal ambition, but it was also happening because the people who were living in Gaul or in Britain were not being taken care of anymore by the central emperors. Like if you take the crisis of the third century, you did have the quote unquote Gallic empire and the Palmyrene empire, and then the Roman empire proper in the middle, which was basically boiled down to um, the Roman authorities not being able to extend protection and aid to the Rhine and to Syria. And so local generals and local leaders took it upon themselves to do it themselves. And so that's something that, yeah, outside of revolutions, those are the kinds of things that we've studied. You've studied it and I've studied it. And so I can see what happens when a bunch of people are looking at who is supposed to be the head man in charge. And the head man in charge is, you know, he's off in Milan someplace and has decided, you know, he's not sending his cavalry uh, because it's, uh, it's not worth it to try to shore up the Rhine frontier at this point. Well, if you live on the Rhine frontier, you kind of got to take your life into your own hands at that point. You can't count on Rome anymore. And so you do break away. Yeah. And I mean, or if you're a Gallic aristocrat in the fifth century and you're being cut off from the plum jobs at the imperial center and there's a Visigothic king sitting in Toulouse a few miles away, you might say, well, maybe I'll go work for that Visigothic king instead of sending my children to go be educated in Rome. Maybe I'll go be his chief chancellor or so you know pick your pick your official like maybe i'll go work for him uh maybe i'll go run his state instead of trying to be prefect of the city of rome those are the choices that aristocrats in in gaul and in spain made over the course of the fifth century and that too is part of what the end of the roman empire was it was choices like that that people made in the in a very particular context if you look and you think well the emperor isn't getting anything done that's not looking so hot i don't see any sort of reciprocal benefit in this I'm just going to stick closer to home. That's an option for how those things can work. And again, these things are happening, you know, not because, oh, you know, things are basically fine and and I'm going to do some stuff that's different. It's happening in the midst of social, political, economic crises where real, real exactly, decisions yeah. are needing to be made with real mm-hmm. life and death consequences. It's that things stop being theoretical. And I think that that's something bringing it all the way back to the impact, the social and economic impact that this virus has had just in the last two months has been so enormous and it has impacted and traumatized so many hundreds of millions of people that we can't even begin to fathom or reckon with the psychic cost that is that this is taking mm-hmm. on everybody in addition to the economic and social cost. So are people's mentalities going to be different? Yeah, I think so. And do we know then what that means? No, of course we don't. But I think that it is just Mm -hmm. so, so frightening that it is happening to happen in the middle of fucking election here. That's also contingency, right? Like in every historical situation that we're talking about, whenever we're looking back at it, we can talk. I mean, I, I love talking about structural factors. I love talking about the deep causality of events. But you can also never get away from the fact that sometimes just like stuff happens when it yep. happens. And that that plays a role that matters, like the timing of things matters. Somebody catching as somebody catching malaria at the wrong time matters. That's just how this stuff works. And so we have I mean, I pro- we probably aren't going to know for a few decades whether this was a really good thing or a really bad thing that this happens to happen in an election year. But it certainly does matter. Yeah, It does. And I mean, the thing is, is specifically the way that we run our political system. Right. Which is which is our legitimacy and the the legitimacy of the United States, the legitimacy of every single state in the United States. And then this is true here in France is true in England is it's elections. We, We this is one of our ideologies is that 
one person, one vote, democracy, is the great legitimizer of whatever the governmental and state institutions are. So the tax regime and all of this, all of the social programs and the military and all the decision makers and all of the leaders derive their legitimacy no longer from God on high. Uh, there's nobody's divinely appointed anymore. Uh, it comes from below and it comes specifically from the ballot box. It's the great civic ritual of the West is going to the ballot box and dropping a piece of paper into a box to indicate who you would like to be the leader of the country. And when we're living with a very particular phenomenon that is preventing us from getting together in groups where the entire, the whole point in order that to save people's lives and to not have people die is for us not to get together like that and for us not to congregate in mm -hmm. one place on one day and everybody go and drop off their um, their ballots. And if, for example, there, there's a really plausible scenario where this thing that we're living through right at this particular moment is the first wave of the virus. And let's say by July, things have eased up. A lot of people have gotten it. Some people are now immune to it. We can start to lighten up on these on, on the lockdown and people start going back to work and things start getting back to normal. And then in October, suddenly there's a second wave of it. Maybe the virus is mutated a little bit. And let's say we have done nothing about voting by mail, making sure that people can cast their ballots through the mail from the privacy and safety of their own homes, as opposed to needing to go to some gymnasium or library or city hall to cast their ballots. When the election comes around, then how legitimate is that election going to be? If you have polling places closing down, people unable to go vote, people saying, I want to get an absentee ballot, but we waited too long, so so now we can't get it, or the state never bothered to get off its ass and actually do something about voting by mail. And so on election day, it's just a massive shit show. And then what happens if it's Bush v. Gore again? It's not like Trump is going to lose by anything more than two points, right? Like to the extent that we're going to have an election, it's going to be close, like that's guaranteed. So it's going to be a close election, and it is going to be very likely a complete – I'm not guaranteeing this, but it could very easily be a situation where in Wisconsin and in Florida and in Michigan and in Pennsylvania and in New Mexico, all of these critical battleground states, that the election itself is going to be rendered so illegitimate that we will not know – who won, and we will not know who to believe, and we will not know who's in charge, and the government of the United States will be quite simply paralyzed, and we won't know what to do about it. This is my fear. This is what keeps me up at night. Yeah, I mean, and that's be, and it's not just that event either. It's that we have, in various ways, been experiencing a long run legitimacy crisis. And I think that that's one way to view the concern about Russian interference in the election is, is this election legitimate? Is this outcome legitimate? That's one way of looking at part of the way that Obama was viewed by uh, by the opposition is, is this a legitimate figure who's allowed to do politics and who's allowed to uh, fulfill the duties of the president? I think that that's like we're dealing with not just this event in isolation. It's not that like suddenly now we're having to question the legitimacy of political outcomes. It's that this is coming on top of a long period in which people on both sides of the partisan divide in different ways and for different reasons have been primed to question the legitimacy of the system. It's like the icing on on a cake of, you know, questioning legitimacy. Yeah, that's exactly right, is that both sides will be primed for it. People forget mm -hmm. this, too, because because Trump actually winning the 2016 election was so unexpected for everybody. But he spent most of October mm -hmm. priming the pump for a great claim to this election was stolen from us. Like that's that was going to be his yep. big post loss PR stunt when he when he moved from the PR stunt that was his campaign to his next PR stunt was going to be oh the election was stolen from us uh, it was rigged the whole thing was rigged he spent all of October talking about how it was all rigged and we're going to go into October again and he's very likely going to be saying the same things and I mean I can't even wrap my head around the number of different ways that people are going to be arguing about this not actually being a legitimate election. Democrats won't accept yeah. it. Republicans won't accept it. Whatever the outcome turns out to be, probably the Electoral mm -hmm. College will throw its hat into the ring just to make things a complete clusterfuck. Whoever wins is going to um, lose the popular vote, but win the Electoral College. And, you know, then it's just going to be, you know, I'll be applying for citizenship. <laughs> <in France. laughs> I'll just I'll just I'll just See, ask him to go ahead and rush my rush my application. <laughs> 
This is why everybody, if they really want to look at the world with the cheeriest possible glasses on, should just spend their time studying yeah. history. Because you can always find things in the present day to make you feel good and warm and fuzzy on the inside. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of different kinds of... So I think we were talking a little bit about this one type of person who is convinced that this is just how things are. Things are normal. Everything's going to be fine. Why are you worried about it? You guys are all, you know, you're crazy alarmists. Everything, everything's fine. Um, this won't change that much. You guys are hysterical. And then there's the other group, this other group of people who are like, well, you know, things have been bad before and we've always gone through tough times, but we've always made it out the other side. And so, so why are you freaking out? Yeah, sure. There was a great depression. Yeah. We made it through. Yeah. There was a, there was a civil war. We made it through that. And it's like, yeah, but do you have any, do you know how bad it was to like live, <laughs> to like live through that? Are you kidding me? Like, oh yeah, well shit was crazy. And everybody died for like, you know, the bubonic plague was bad. Sure. But you know, you came out the other side of that and you know, median wages for the average worker had gone up like 67%. Yeah, but you- <laughs> But you Thanos snapped half the population out of Yeah, existence. exactly. And you're like, that's you're bad. Like, like, that's and they bad. and they look to me sometimes as a historian to like back them up where they're saying, like, so let's talk to this historian. You know, he he knows that things have been bad and we've been okay. And I'm like, Are you kidding me? <laughs> like, that stuff was all horrible. I don't I don't want to live through any of that. Yeah, see, this is the thing I think about all the time when it comes to climate change is like, I don't think actual human extinction is an especially likely outcome, but I do think a drastic reduction in population is probably within the realm of possibility and maybe even the actual likely outcome that like the earth will just be able to support a lot fewer people living in a lot less of a technologically complex way. Like that's perfectly plausible. Sure. Like, I don't think we're all going to die, but there may be a lot fewer of us living a lot less pleasantly. And then there will be people who are around after all of that happens. Um, you know, <laughs> like I and I actually I think it will actually be not necessarily even that bad. I don't think there needs to be a drastic reduction in the number of people, but I think it will. I think it will remake the global political economy. Of course, it will. Like that's oh, yeah. that's yeah. Like, 100%. I think I think most of the states that we currently take for granted in the same way that they took the Holy Roman Empire for granted are going to be fundamentally different entities. Like, let's just be really conservative and say 200 years from now, what is the political map of the world look like? I think it looks very different than it does right now. But you're going to get people who are alive then who are like, yeah, but yeah, I mean, we lived through it. It was fine. It's like, yeah, but like, you know how... (laughs) Like there was there was the seventh civil war and then there was the eight you know there, you, do you remember you remember corona 108 you know you guys you know corona 108 that was a really bad one um or covid 108 like, world war world yeah, war five world war was five really was bad terrible right and then we're like yeah, but, but back, you, know, you're, you're, you study history you know you know we always get through these things and the, the people who live make it through in one piece man yeah that is quite literally survivor's yeah, bias. Yeah, it is the literal definition of survivor's bias. Is On that especially cheery note, Mike, thank you so much for chatting with me. Uh, thank you for having me to chat. I, I feel really just so uplifted right now. <laughs> Great. Going <laughs> yeah, forward. I, I mean... L- Look, like part of the job of being a historian, frankly, is that I don't think you're supposed to make people feel yeah. better. Like that's not the that's not the job. The job is not to tell stories that make people feel better. The job is trying to convey some sense of what what's happened and why and why that should be meaningful to us. And it's not like your job is to be Cassandra, like just shouting about upcoming disasters, but like your job is to try to represent these things faithfully. Yeah, and I I mean I, I have this little like aphorism that I like which is that you study the past so that you can make decisions in the present that will make for a better future. That's Mm -hmm. sort of the triptych that I always see going on. Like, yes, I'm shouting about how this could all be very, very bad because I don't want it to be very, very bad. Um, yeah, so exactly. so let's let's exactly. let because I don't want it. People are like, oh, you lo- you must be loving this. Like I'm not loving this. I don't want any of this to be happening. So I do want to study the past. I do want to tell you how bad things have been before. I do want to tell you that things could be bad again. In fact, they will be bad again. Things are going to be bad again. But if you pay attention and if you realize that things could be bad again, then yeah, we do have agency. I don't believe that history is some you know crazy spiritual force that just molds us and does to us what it will you know i'm not you know i like tolstoy but i don't believe everything tolstoy says that i don't think that we're just molded by forces beyond our ken we do have agency we can control Mm -hmm. events we can respond to things and i think that historical literacy and embracing embracing that instead of trying to stay aloof from it uh is is a very good strategy
I 100% agree. Mike, thank you again. Let's do this again sometime soon. Oh, sure. Well, anytime I'm starting to feel better, we should get back together. Yeah, I've been told I have that effect on people. So, Mike, what do you have coming out? When when can we expect to see Citizen Lafayette? And do you want to come chat with me about that when it comes out? Oh, I'll come chat with you about Citizen Lafayette for sure. So I'm finishing it right now. I just ended what became part one of the Russian revolutions. We just wrapped up the revolution of 1905. And I'll spend the next six months or so writing Citizen Lafayette. And then I'll come back, and in October, the manuscript will be done. I'll go back to work on part two of the Russian Revolution, uh, which will be about 1917 and the Russian Civil War that, that followed. And then Citizen Lafayette will be coming out in the spring of 2021. So I think it's about one calendar year from now, there should be a physical book that is actually going to be out on the shelves, and it's called Citizen Lafayette. And uh, you will all be able to enjoy the fun adventures of the Marquis de Lafayette as he goes through 50 years of crazy economic, social, <laughs> cultural, political turmoil, death, and destruction that he himself managed to live through, mostly a lot of it through dumb luck, but also five years in an Austrian prison. <laughs> Um, that's what said. the the only way the only way he didn't get his head chopped off was by spending five years basically in solitary confinement in like dungeons in Germany. So even the ones who lived don't necessarily have the best time of it through these times through these times. Well, I cannot wait to read it, and I look forward to chatting with you about it again when it comes out. Mike, thanks so much for joining Thank me. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining me today. Be sure and drop me a line if you'd like to chat about the fall of the Roman Empire or the rise of the modern world. You can find me on Twitter at Patrick underscore Wyman or on Facebook at Patrick Wyman MMA. You can follow the show at Tides History. If you haven't already, don't forget to subscribe to Tides of History on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you're listening to this right now. If you've been enjoying the show, I'd really appreciate it if you left a five-star rating and a review. Tides of History is written and narrated by me, Patrick Wyman. The sound engineer is Sergio Enriquez. Tides of History is produced by Morgan Jaffe. From Wondery, the executive producers are Leah Sutherland and Hernan Lopez. Thanks again for listening. Until next time, from Wondery, this has been Tides of History. Which muscled action star ran a jewelry theft ring as a teenager in Hawaii? How did a critically acclaimed actor get chewed out by the public and the police for a scandalous cannibalism kink? And which heiress turned actress found herself firing a submachine gun when she was kidnapped by a terrorist organization? And these are just a few of the questions I'll answer on an all new season of Badlands. A true crime podcast hosted by me, Jake Brennan, that dives into the real stories of the famous at their most infamous. With new episodes every Wednesday, I dive deeper into the notorious characters of Tinseltown than ever before, featuring the insane true stories of John Belushi, Army Hammer, Charlie Chaplin, Lucille Ball, Bob Crane of Hogan's Heroes, Patty Hearst, and Dwayne The Rock Johnson. For all this and more, listen to Badlands wherever you get your podcasts. Or binge the entire new season right now, only on Amazon Music.